Well, hello, Kimberly. Hi, Fakis. Uh, well, we're going to uh, kick off the session uh, uh, on climate change. Uh, and during our days, we've seen climate change turn into climate crisis. So now we are in a crisis. And it's about time we started talking about this crisis in a matter in a manner that everyone can understand. In the business environment, and particularly within large corporations, there is a strong discussion about uh, climate, um, climate risks, climate strategies, embedding uh, climate strategies and decarbonization as part of ESG strategies. So there is a long process of dragging the um, uh, the business community into a discussion and making change towards this, uh, this direction. There is also a, a very strong regulatory environment uh, within the banking sector, starting and uh, as a uh, an application of the European Green Deal and how this transcends into the uh, the economy. So there is a lot of discussion about climate crisis, and there is a lot of discussion on a corporate level. But most people we know would be quite indifferent and quite numb to the uh, findings of the latest report of the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. How many people do we know that know these things and care about those things? To most people we know, a temperature change of 1.5 or 2 degrees centigrade would be a mere setting on the air conditioning. And it doesn't really mean much to their lives. We desperately need facts, figures, and few simple words in order to get this message across. Last year in 2021, Greece suffered some of the worst forest wildfires we've ever experienced. Those uh, wildfires burned 1,300 square kilometers, or roughly 1% of the country's territory. If IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, if they are correct, and they probably are, if we extrapolate a rise in, in temperature of 3 degrees centigrade, this would mean for Greece that it would burn about 2 to 3% of our territory every year. This is a catastrophic situation that we need to talk about this and make it understood. For this, we need people to explain what's going on with, with climate crisis in a manner that we can all together understand and act together. For this, we are welcoming Dr. Kimberly Miner. She's a climate scientist at NASA and at the California Institute of Technology. Uh, she's a professor at Virginia Tech, a research assistant professor at the University of Maine, and advisor on climate issues. Another impressive uh, part of her resume is that Dr. Miner was recently honored as one of the 120 uh, really uh, impactful women scientists, ambassadors by the Smithsonian Institute. If you read her, um, her LinkedIn profile, it says, the Earth is at a turning point. In the next few years, we will decide what the future looks like for all life on the planet and whether we can stop the climate crisis. I manage teams across science and engineering to develop most cutting edge data and information on the changes happening all over the planet. From satellites to glacier meltwater sampling, my research on climate risks takes me to the most extreme environments in the world. I have researched climate change in both poles, the Alps, the Canadian Rockies, and Mount Everest. So here we have Dr. Kimberly Miner with us. So what motivates a scientist to work for NASA and take on climate change? Well, ever since I was a little girl, I've been so inspired by the natural world around me. And the wonderful thing about my 
profession and earth science right now is that we can look at it from so many scales. I can go hike mountains and climb glaciers and do what we call in situ work, you know, hands-on work. We can also look from satellites and get a good understanding of what's going on all over the world. And it's a really unique time to be an earth scientist as well because you can be part of this bigger purpose-driven discussion that we're all having here about what the future of the world looks like. And we have these critical decisions to make that we've had unlike any other time in human history where we decide whether or not we want to have a sustainable future as we are all talking about here today or something that's going to be more difficult, more problematic, more challenging in these rolling crises. Is your purpose evolving over time? The thing that drives you, is that changing over time? Sure. I think, you know, as I learn more, as things progress, I think this summer was a wake-up call for many of us, the heat waves um, that were these unexpected um, crises of heat and uh, forest fires in Europe and in where I live in California. I think that my purpose is always evolving, but this uh, going back to nature-based solutions, going back to how we figure out ways to rewild or to plant trees or to encourage more birds or to, to live in better harmony with the world around us, that's never changing for me. Okay. So let's talk about the climate crisis. Let's talk about your research in the Arctic. What, what do you learn there? What, what do you share from, from, from that work? So I've actually been to the Arctic uh, three times this year. So I went to uh, Alaska in the spring and then Canada in the summer. I just was in Norway um, teaching uh, climate summer school. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but there are often these weeks of punctuated learning where you have students. Um, it's like a camp from the 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and you teach them about climate science the whole time. And so, we have the opportunity to explore the Arctic and look at it scientifically and culturally in ways that we've never had before because it is less frozen, it is more open, we have more navigation possibilities through the ocean, through the air, through the land, and we can really see the way that it's changing. Now that also brings a lot of problems, right? So the, uh, the permafrost, for example, the soil that is frozen for two years or more stores a lot of carbon. So there's a potential that if that were to thaw, if the ice were to go away, the carbon could be emitted to the atmosphere. And so there's a lot of challenges that are emerging with the unfreezing of the poles, with them warming up. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of sea level rise being a really big problem when the ice is melting. But there are things that we are trying to learn about the Arctic and we are always catching up because it's moving so fast, the change is happening so fast that we can't get there before the change happens. And so we're always in catch up mode, learning behind the changes. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about different tipping points in, in the climate change crisis. Uh, what does your research show? Uh, are we getting close to a, a tipping point, to a, the, the, the point of no return, the point that the, the climate change will speed up at a, at a certain point that uh, the, the damage cannot be fixed? Are we, are, what do you, how do you reckon the, the, uh, the, the position we're in in relation to a tipping point? So I think the research is showing that we are getting very close. There was a paper recently in Science Magazine, came out two or three weeks ago, probably three weeks ago now, talking about all the tipping points across the world that we are just about to breach. So everything from corals to rainforests, to um, ice and snow and permafrost melting, to um, circulation in the ocean shutting down or changing. And all of these are incredibly delicate systems um, that are, if they were to change to a tipping point or to a new state, we would not be able to recover them to the way that we're used to them. And so not only is that a challenge for the ecosystems on the whole planet, it would be a challenge for humans because we're used to a certain way of things. We're used to ocean circulation being a certain way. We're used to the atmosphere being a certain way. We're used to having certain types of food and water access. And if all of that changes, it will be very difficult for us to survive in the same way that we have for many generations. Funny you should say that about uh, survival of the species. Um, one of the 
issues that we, we want to touch up a lot of this in, in this conference is the, the different interconnections between the different crises. And after our session, we will have another session uh, regarding um, uh, uh, biodiversity, and we see how that, that evolves. But uh, it is important that we, um, uh, we focus on interconnections in what we, what we call the uh, systemic approach. There is this notion that just about everything we do for biodiversity is good for the climate, but the same cannot be said for the reverse. A lot of things that we might do for climate might have negative biodiversity outcomes. So there is this, this theory. What, 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 is, what is that you witness when you visit the, um, uh, the Arctics? Uh, how do, what does it tell you in relation to the, the change in the, uh, in the physical environment and the, and the threat to, to climate change? What connection can we make there? Well, let me address first what you said about climate versus biodiversity. I think that's true if we think about um, a human-based geoengineering approach to climate, that we could uh, inadvertently sacrifice biodiversity. But if we think of them, like you were saying, systemically together, we can always improve and increase biodiversity and have a positive impact on the climate. So I think that's a really important thing to think about is how they go hand in hand together and not separating the two, right? Because the atmosphere and encompasses the whole planet, including all the biodiversity. As far as Arctic changes go, um, things are changing very, very rapidly. So whether it's vegetation moving northward, changing where it grows, um, whether it's animals like caribou or elk um, also moving northward, uh, the permafrost, as I mentioned, thawing, which leaves sometimes giant holes in the earth or losing glaciers. And you have to remember that glaciers are not only you know, beautiful and they help stabilize the ocean and the atmosphere, they also provide water for billions and billions of people through the summers. So without this reservoir of water that people can use in the summer, it will be very difficult to get through these punctuated dry periods that we find ourselves facing. It's, um, it, it's very important what you say about glaciers. There is this, um, this discussion that we can have uh, uh, later on. The melting of glaciers uh, that they're storing, uh, for instance, bacteria that have been locked in there for uh, thousands of years, and now the melting of those glaciers are releasing those bacteria to, to, to the environment. Uh, this has a, a clear interconnection with what, uh, what we call planetary health. So, what is the, the, the situation? Uh, uh, what, is the, what is this climate situation that needs uh, this so-called uh, regenerative approach? Uh, not only avoiding damage to the environment, but also uh, try to repairing damage. Um, th this is an approach that is building up in, in, in the corporate uh, jargon. Sure. No, I strongly believe that humans have not intentionally damaged the environment. We got very excited with the Industrial Revolution about how things could be, and then with plastics and with pesticides, we got very excited about the ability to survive on a very challenging and harsh environment. And I think that we learned a good deal of things, and now we understand that our actions have consequences. And so we have the opportunity through just this generation and the future generations to decide what actions we want to do. So whether we work uh, together with nature, we do, as you're saying, restorative and regenerative practices to keep everything going in the sustainable way, or whether we are more in a taking position where we're always taking from the environment and never really restoring or giving back. The problem with being in this constant taking stance that we have taken in the last 100 years or so is that it's not permanent, right? We eventually will have taken too much and there will be very little to uh, receive. So the idea that we can be in more of a, a mutual relationship with the world around us, I think is emergent and is a good part of what we're discussing here today. And it's something that businesses can absolutely participate in. It's just gonna take a little bit of innovation and a little bit of uh, technology and a little bit of thought and creativity. And it's gonna take leadership. Sure. So I, I've got a question to you regarding uh, leadership. Um, going back in time, um, uh, during his term in office, uh, President Jimmy Carter, uh, he, he fought for, for clean energy and, um, he, and he, was, um, uh, he was talking a lot about renewable sources. So uh, as a symbol of his faith to, to clean energy and the power of the sun, as he was saying, 
Carter had 32 solar panels installed uh, on the White House. So that was in the summer of 1979. These panels that were used to heat water in the, um, uh, in, in the, in the White House until uh, the next president, Ronald Reagan, had them removed in 1986, and they were stored uh, for quite many years uh, in, a, in a government uh, warehouse, and then they were finally donated to a, a college in, in Maine. This raises a number of questions in my mind, uh, a lot of what ifs. Mm. So, uh, I mean, what if Carter had a second term in, in office? What if uh, Al Gore, uh, was ever elected uh, president in, in 2000. So we witnessed in terror President Trump pulling out of the Paris Accord, and then we were all relieved uh, when the current administration was repositioned. So my question to you is this. What do political and business leaders need in order to position themselves on the right side of history? What do they need in order to make the right judgment? I was thinking a little bit about this uh, with some of the earlier speakers, about how sometimes uh, our stance on the environment changes with the current political situation. And I think that's kind of the key to it. I think that understanding science, understanding um, engineering, understanding math, doing this um, kind of like our last speaker was discussing, um, education, starting at a young age and then moving through so that people really understand what's going on in the world around them, what the changes are, what it could mean, what the consequences could be. I think that's how we sway public opinion and, and build a general morality around the environment is by really understanding science. And a big part of that is science education and science communication. Which is my final question to you. We've seen We've heard a lot of scientists through our time. We've had scientists visiting, scientists visiting conferences just as th this one. Let's talk about science communication, though. Let's talk about the way those knowledgeable people are able to transmit their knowledge in a way that the public understands. We need, I'm sure you agree, that we, we need scientists that go beyond the, the state of a, a lab rat, someone who's very knowledgeable but never gets out uh, and talks about th those things. And we, we are way past the, the, the typical movie scenario when you have the scientist saying, oh, I told you so, that there's going to be uh, a disaster coming up. So what type of scientists do we need today? What, what type of people do we need in order to get this knowledge and take it across to society? Well, I would argue that science requires all kinds. Um, and some people are really good at science communication and some people are not. So some people are good at other things. They're good at modeling. They're good at uh, forecasting. Some people are very good at discussing uh, science with others. And I think it takes all kinds. Um, one of the things that we have been focusing on as the ambassadors that you mentioned is um, showing young people what scientists can look like, right? So they don't all look like this, uh, this lab person that you were discussing. They can look all different kinds. They can be women, they can be men, they can be multiple genders, they can have orange hair or golden hair or black hair. And they all have something to give and they all have the ability to do science. And that's a big part of what we're trying to communicate to the younger generations is that science is in everything and being able to be a scientist you know, is something that anyone who chooses to can do. And that wasn't true when I was growing up. There, I didn't have the same kind of role models. I've um, said before to you, Bacchus, that I had role models from television who were actresses. They were not scientists. But they played scientists on TV. And so that was who I had to look up to. And you know, when I'm having a rough day, those are still the movies that I watch. But we are really trying hard to give the younger generations now some role models that they can look to who are scientists, that they can ask these critical scientific questions to as they shape their life. Um, I'm working on a book right now talking about planning for the future and how to choose your housing, how to choose where you live, how to choose whether or not you have kids, because it's a very challenging and scary time right now. And that's something that we need um, people of all kinds, scientists of all kinds, to be a part of. And that's what I'm trying to, to share with everybody, especially the younger generations. 
Well, Dr. Kimberly Miner, thank you for being here and for sharing this with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.